I'm conducting research in a state child welfare agency. Uh, this is the agency that has the responsibility of you know, taking care of the state's children, removing children if necessary, investing allegations of abuse, that kind of thing. And uh, a few years ago, there was a new commissioner who came in, and he had no background in child welfare work, or um, he was a great administrator. And he was struck immediately by the incredibly difficult job that these social workers have to do every day, enormously stressful. You know, a right or wrong decision could have terrible consequences, potentially. So he wondered whether it would make more sense to have teams of social workers working with families instead of individual social workers. And he thought for a couple of reasons. First of all, there'd be more brains in thinking about the family. These are very complex problems and issues. And also there would be more emotional support for the workers themselves. And the combination of those two things might end up with better outcomes for the families involved. So a few years ago, the agency uh, began a pilot project. They had seven teams of social workers around the state um, think about working together in a new and different way. And I started gathering data on these teams just as they began their work together, and I observed them for about two and a half years. So, and it turns out that the teams of the seven, uh, two of them basically relapsed altogether. So they tried new ways of working, but they weren't able to maintain them, and they went back to the traditional way of working. There were two teams that made a lot of changes in their practice, but then retreated from that. They weren't able to hang on. Um, they, they hung on to some of them. They didn't relapse altogether, but they lost a lot of ground. And then the third group were three teams who were actually able to fully recreate themselves. They um, made a lot of changes in the way they worked, and they maintained those changes over the two and a half years. The question is what enabled some teams to learn better than other teams. And we had hypotheses that certain team characteristics would enable learning. And we also wanted to look at certain individual characteristics of the team members to see if that made a difference. So what we found was that um, the team characteristics really trumped the individual characteristics. So they turned out to be much more important. So what matters? A clear direction. If the teams had a very clear purpose, a very clear mission, that enabled them to learn better together. Interestingly, if the teams had a clear sense of their membership, if there was a clear boundary around the team and they knew who was in the team and who was outside the team, that enabled them to, to learn better. An effective team leader, not surprisingly, makes a big difference. The support from their superiors, so the team's direct superior, their boss, their immediate boss, and also the director of the area office, if the teams felt that those people were really on their side and were doing what they could to support the team and enable them to get their work done, that seemed to make a big difference. And then the last team characteristic that really seems to matter is the team's capacity for reflection. And one of the hallmarks of Wagner is uh, a focus on reflective practice. And uh, that was certainly borne out in these teams. So the extent to which the teams could surface embedded assumptions about how they normally work and really try to rethink those, the capacity for team members to, to say, you know, I think maybe I made a mistake here, I, maybe I made a mistake in judgment, just to make themselves vulnerable. Those kinds of things seem to make a difference in the team's capacity to learn.